I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Um, Ashley Gerhardt really um, does not need an introduction. I think there was a little bit of uh, preamble to some of what she might um, be talking about in the prior talk, but um, suffice it to say that she had an incredible uh, uh, time of development at Yale University and um, developed um, the, um, the uh, indices that are kind of, um, you know, really uh, at the center of understanding uh, uh, several aspects of food addiction while she was there. And uh, more recently, as her career has taken off, she's transitioned um, her efforts to the University of Michigan, where she runs the uh, FAST uh, lab there. And um, it is, uh, again, also now becoming one of the real linchpins in, in um, uh, helping uh, move the field forward in this area. And um, she's made seminal contributions to the field along the way. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to uh, uh, join in welcoming um, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm completely honored to be here. And uh, following Mark Gold is always a hard act. Uh, he's so charming and entertaining. So I hope I can kind of you know, keep, keep the momentum going. Right. So I'm here to speak with you today about what is the current evidence that there might be an addictive role at play when it comes to food and the way that we eat. And this also goes back to Mark. I like to start my talk by thinking about how do we create a substance we know is addictive? What is the process that occurs that we take something in our world, in our environment, that is rewarding and reinforcing and we change it so it becomes particularly powerful and capable of hijacking reward-related systems? So Mark talked a lot about cocaine and I would like to start with the coca leaf. Uh, the coca leaf is a naturally growing leaf. It's a big part of cultural society, especially in Latin America. And it's a leaf that you can chew or suck on, and it gives a little bit of that stimulant properties. Uh, it's used a lot in work in the Andes. If you're up in the mountains and there's not a lot of air, you need that extra burst of energy. But in its form, as the coca leaf, it does not appear to be highly addictive. People don't seem to lose control of it or have intense cravings. It's more like a tea that we would experience in our society here. But as humans, we're really good at taking things that are reinforcing and making them more powerful and potent. So if you take that coca leaf and you refine it down and you make it cocaine, where the dose is much more potent and the rate that that in addictive substance hits your body as more rapid, you get a highly addictive drug. If you process it even more and you make it so it's cheap and it's more easily accessible in the form of crack cocaine, you see an epidemic of addiction across the, across the world. So I like to think about what we have been doing to our food environment and especially the last 30 and 40 years. If you think of the food environment that we evolved in, Food, especially high calorie foods, were relatively scarce. And the foods at the top of that hedonic ladder that were really rewarding and reinforcing were foods like fruits and nuts that had higher levels of fats and sugars in them. And we are evolutionarily designed to want to seek out and find those foods, to be motivated to get them, to remember where they are. Because for so much of our existence, those foods were scarce and we needed them to help us survive times of famine. But over time, we've gotten really good, especially in our industrialized society, at extracting things like fat and sugars and refined carbohydrates cheaply and effectively. And so now we have these ingredients that are really, really rewarding in more potent doses, and we then combine them into thousands of different food types that are high in both sugars, fats, salts, food additives. I mean, just to give you a feel for how different our food environment is now compared to the food environment that we evolved in, when I started doing this research, we noticed, wow, there really aren't naturally occurring foods that are high both in carbohydrates and high in fat. If you think about that, you have fruits that are higher in sugar, but they don't really have a lot of fat. You have foods that are higher in fat, like nuts and meats, but they don't really have a lot of carbohydrates. Just the fact that the majority of the foods that we consume today in our food environment have a combined combination of high levels of fats and high levels of carbohydrates is a food that is unique to the reward system of our brains and much more powerful than anything our brains really evolved to handle. So the question is, 
Have these foods become so powerful and so potent that at least for some individuals, they're capable of triggering an addictive response? And so when I was first at Yale and, and thinking about what, what do I want to spend my career on? What, I'm here now. You know, what kind of research do I want to do? Um, there was all this really beautiful emerging work that I felt like was coming together at the same time. So again, Mark was referencing the work from Bart Hobel's lab with Nicole Avina taking a lead role with these animal models, finding these really notable parallels between the administration of sugar and, and, the, and drugs of abuse. So as Mark mentioned, with sugar you could see this binging behavior, this release of dopamine that wouldn't go down in the way we expect to see with typical eating behavior. You saw withdrawal being able to be precipitated by the administration of drugs that we usually use and drugs of abuse. We saw that for foods that were high in fats and sugars, you could see a downgrading of the dopamine system that was linked to behaviors that we really thought of as indicative of drugs of abuse, of addiction to drugs of abuse. Um, one example coming out of Paul, Kinney, uh, Paul Kinney's lab was that rats that were exposed to things like bacon and cheeseburger and M&Ms became so kind of used to that level of hedonic food reward that even though they would have their chow that they usually like, they usually ate just fine, they were usually motivated by, right next to them they'd have their bowl of chow in their cage. That food, after being exposed to these highly rewarding foods, no longer did it for them anymore. And even though they could have those calories, they would go out into electrified mazes, getting shocked to try and find the M&Ms that were hidden in the maze. So what this suggests, perhaps, is that exposure to these foods that are so potently rewarding seems to potentially cause neuroadaptations in our reward and motivation systems in the brain, where more naturally occurring foods that we used to like and eat just fine just can't compete, at least in these animal models. At the same time, Nora Volkow's group was doing some beautiful neuroimaging work, really showing parallels in the neural systems that seem to go awry in the context of obesity and the context of addiction. For example, Mark talked a lot about those cues, driving down the highway, seeing the golden arches, that in both obesity and addiction, these cues can become really powerful and capable of acting, activating intense dopaminergic responses that are linked with craving and motivation. There also seems to be some diminishing capacity in the cognitive control systems of the brain, making people more reactive and more motivated to the cues in their environment while simultaneously struggling to kind of put on the brakes. These seem to be parallels between obesity and addiction. So this led me to ask, is obesity just food addiction? Are these two things one and the same? And in my group, we really felt that there were some problems with over-relying on obesity as a pure pro proxy for food addiction. There are so many pathways to obesity. It's really a heterogeneous medical condition. You can uh, consider medication side effects, physical inactivity, genetic conditions that could lead one to be obese. Additionally, it is not that hard to consume enough calories to start to be overweight or obese. It really only takes a couple extra hundred calories a day. So you may not need to be showing an intense kind of compulsive eating behavior to necessarily start to see your BMI go up. So if we use obesity as this proxy for food addiction, that may be over-identifying people and saying there's an addictive process at play here, but that may not necessarily be the case. On the other flip side of things, we can't assume that just because someone has a normal body weight that they necessarily have a healthy relationship with food. There are so many ways in which I think especially, um, I'm doing a lot of work with teenagers at this moment, and they're young and they have those metabolisms that we all kind of miss, you know, but some of them will have this relationship with food, this drive, this compulsion, this eating to the point where they get physically ill, intense cravings, self-hatred about their consumption of food. But if I look at their BMI, they have a normal body weight at this point in their life. And so I can't look at someone's body mass index and assume I know their relationship with food.
Further, we have a certain set of shared diagnostic criteria that we use if someone's walking into my office as a clinical psychologist and I'm trying to understand, are you a social user of alcohol? Are you occasional user of cocaine? Or do you actually experience an addictive response? Have you met that threshold? We have a certain set of criteria to look at that. So it seems like investigating those diagnostic criteria and saying, did those show up in people's relationship with food was a good place to start. So at the time that I was doing this work in um, 2007, 2008 initially, uh, the DSM-4 was what we were using for diagnosis. And so I'm gonna go over a quick um, review of what the diagnostic criteria for what we called substance dependence at that time was. So it was substance use in the last 12 months leading to three or more of the following. Tolerance, you need more and more of the substance to get the same effect. Withdrawal, and this can be that you have physical withdrawal like headaches or stomach aches, but maybe even more importantly we see is this emotional withdrawal, depression, anxiety, agitation, when you stop or cut down on the substance. That seems to be particularly predictive of relapse. There's a tendency where people experience a diminished sense of control, that once they start, they say, okay, I'm gonna have that one glass of wine for happy hour, and the next thing you know, there may be a bottle or two later, that there's this diminished sense of control over consumption. I think one of the big um, myths about addiction is that people aren't trying to cut down. I have never seen anyone in my office who has not tried at least 20, 30 things, anything. I have this rule to stop myself drinking alcohol. I have this rule to help myself eat it. Stop, help myself stop eating so much. The people are trying, they're attempting to cut down and they're repeatedly failing. There's a great deal of time spent acquiring, using or recovering from the effects of the substance. Important activities are given up because of use. The use starts to become kind of the central factor, factor in someone's life. And there's continued use despite persistent problems, either physical, emotional, social problems. So, in 2007-2008, we developed the Yale Food Addiction Scale. And this is a scale developed to operationalize food addiction by applying those same diagnostic criteria I just reviewed and applying that to the consumption of these high added carbohydrate, high added fat foods. And when you score the Yale Food Addiction Scale, there's two ways you can look at it. You can look at it where you see how many symptoms do people have, ranging from no symptoms to seven symptoms. And we also have a diagnostic threshold, which again mirrors the same diagnostic threshold we use with other drugs of abuse, which is three or more symptoms in a 12-month period plus clinically significant impairment or distress. At this point, the scale was published in 2009, and it's been evaluated in non-clinical samples, clinical samples, epidemiological samples, and it's been found to be both valid and reliable. At this point, the scale's been cited over 350 times and has been translated and validated in seven different foreign languages. Due to the kind of global spread in our current Western food environment and the obesity and binge eating that goes along with that. So to give you more of a sense of the scale, I included some sample questions from our first version. Um, so I kept consuming the same types of food or the same amount of food, even though I was having emotional and or physical problems. Over time, I have found that I need to eat more and more to get the feeling I want, such as reduce negative emotions or increase pleasure. And I have had withdrawal symptoms when I cut down or stopped eating certain foods, such as developing physical symptoms, feeling agitated or anxious. It's also important to note that again, this whole scale wasn't talking about eating in general, but specifically referencing the consumption of high calorie, high fat, high added refined carbs that are so much more potently rewarding than foods that we developed to consume and foods that are high in nutrition value. We decided this because when reviewing the literature, when we looked at what did people binge eat on, what did they lose control of, what did they have such strong cravings that they struggle to adhere to dietary um, goals for themselves, it isn't foods like apples or you know, carrots. So you know, I know that's not surprising. Kale was not high on the list, but it was foods like cupcakes, ice cream. So that is really what we focused on here. And I think you know, one of the reactions I get a lot when I um, say you know I do research on food and addiction is, well, how can you be addicted to food, right? Everybody has to eat. What's the abstinence approach? You know, starving? And I think it's important to note that even from the very beginning, we were saying not all foods are created equal, that there's these certain foods that actually are not 
beneficial for our long-term health and survival. Those are the same foods that seem to be particularly effective in gauging reward systems in a problematic way. So what's important, I think, is just because we developed a scale that says food addiction does not mean that food addiction exists. It's a scale to try and operationalize this in a more strong, valid way and then test, does it tell us anything? Do people that are high on this scale, do they have more diet-related consequences? Are mechanisms that we know contribute to other addictions, do they seem to be playing a role here? That's the next step. That's what we have to do. And so at this point, we have seen that individuals who have higher scores on the YFAS have more diet-related consequences, more obesity, more severe obesity, more binge eating episodes, more hypercholesterolemia, more diabetes, and that they have a harder time losing weight in weight loss treatments. So we see that there are these consequences that are associated with this scale. We also see that psychological mechanisms that are key to other addictions are associated with the scale. So I think of craving as one of those key constructs that drive addiction. I would say of all the constructs out there, food craving seems to be particularly strongly related to individuals with high YFAS scores, even after controlling for BMI. Individuals also seem to exhibit more attentional biases for these high calorie food cues in their environment, where if you walk into a party and there's a bunch of food that individuals with these higher scores, their attention, attention is captured by, let's say, the buffet table with the desserts. They're showing these attentional biases. There also seems to be some issues with cognitive control and impulsivity, and also a motivation to consume these foods, not out of homeostatic need, not because you're calorically deprived, but because you wanna feel pleasure or you're trying to regulate emotions, especially disassociating from negative emotions. Again, consistent parallels with what we see drive other sorts of addictions. We also see that there are biological similarities. So Carolyn Davis has done some really nice work finding that genetic alleles associated with dysfunction and dopamine processing are associated with food addiction and even controlling for BMI. We can also see that individuals with higher food addiction scores respond differently to dopamine agonist that trigger dopamine responses in the brain. So this dopamine dysfunction also seems to be associated with the YFAS. And I wanna pause for just a moment and emphasize how important it is to think about this with kids. You know, my initial training was in alcohol research until I, I met up Kelly and started doing this fabulous work with my addiction advisor, Will Corbin, and my eating advisor, Kelly Brownell, and we came together and started doing this work. And one of the things that when we started thinking about this is what's different between something like sugar and something like alcohol? Well, if we think about alcohol, when early experimentation or exposure is most likely to take place is in adolescence or early adulthood. And that is even concerning because the brain is more malleable and more plastic and heavy use of things like alcohol and marijuana at this stage can disrupt the normal development of the brain and make people more prone to the development of alcohol-related or cannabis-related problems. In contrast, if you think of these foods, they, there's exposure to this in the first year of life, in the first years of life. After the age of two, a child is more likely to have a sugar-sweetened food or beverage on a given day than a fruit or a vegetable. So even if these foods have less addictive potential or potency than things like heroin or cocaine, given the early vulnerable stages of repeated exposure when the brain is just developing and habits around eating are just developing, this may cause the development of what looks like an addiction very early in life. And so we developed the Yale Food Addiction Scale for children to start to look at this. Surprisingly, in a community sample of children, these aren't children who were in treatment, these aren't children who we developed, got from a pediatric obesity center, these were just children we recruited from the community, 7% of them met the YFAS cutoff for showing an addiction to food. On average, children were showing two symptoms. This is higher than what we actually see in adults, where we see typically on average across all people, one symptom. Children are maybe showing more of this. Children with these higher YFAS scores had higher elevated body mass index. They were more prone to eat in response to emotions. They were less responsive to their satiety signals. And observing what they actually ate in our lab, even when we controlled for their body mass index, these children with higher YFAS scores ate more food. So I think it's really important when I think about what are some of the implications of this work, why does it matter, is thinking about children's and 
children and infants and how this may be setting them up for lifelong problems with eating. And there's also some potential evidence that there may be some cross transfer to risk for other drugs of abuse. So this is really important to consider. And going back to the brain and thinking about what kind of brain dysfunction is potentially related to these high YFAS scores, I did some work with colleagues Eric Stice and Sonia Yoakum where we did some neuroimaging work with 48 healthy young women. On average, these women were overweight, and they ranged from normal weight to severe obesity. We excluded everyone who had an eating disorder. And this is, I think, um, in some ways it was kind of handicapping us a little bit. You know, we're not getting people who are having binge eating disorder or bulimia, but it also helps us ask the question of what really is food addiction? Is it just an eating disorder that we already know exists? We know that none of these individuals had an eating disorder. And all our analyses we controlled for the effect of their body mass index. We brought them in the scanner, and we repeatedly showed them pictures of a chocolate milkshake or a glass of water. Then individuals actually consumed either a chocolate haagen milkshake or a neutral control stimu a stimulus in the scanner. So this provides this really nice opportunity to both look at anticipatory response to those cues that Mark talked about was so strong for him, as well as what's happening when you're actually consuming the substance. So what did we find? We found that young women who had higher food addiction scores were particularly reactive to those milkshake cues relative to the control cues. In particular, they showed greater activation in the medial, medial orbital frontal cortex, the amygdala, the caudate, which is part of the striatum, key neural regions that are implicated in the salience of cues in drug addiction, enhanced motivation in drug addiction, and incentive salience, where the cues really stick out to you and are really capable of triggering responses and motivation. So this cue response was really, really powerful for those individuals who had higher YFAS scores. What about when they were consuming the milkshake? We weren't sure, we thought maybe these individuals were gonna find the chocolate milkshake so much more pleasurable and rewarding. And we actually didn't see that. We found that when they were consuming the milkshake, the big difference here was that a, the lateral orbital frontal cortex, which in addiction has been implicated in cognitive control in some studies, was not working as well when they were consuming the chocolate milkshake relative to the neutral control stimulus which suggests that these individuals have this one-two punch of a really intense reward-related response when they see these cues, this kind of intense go signal. But when they start consuming the substance, the breaks, the stop signal, doesn't seem to be working as well. And this also parallels what we see with drugs of abuse. So in summary, for this study, we saw that there were greater neural differences during the cue versus the consumption. And this really struck me as indicative of a very imminent theory in addiction called the incentive sensitization theory of addiction. And what this suggests is that when you first start using an addictive substance, you might like it and enjoy it, and you really want it. You respond to the cues for it. But over time, there seems to be an uncoupling of what starts to drive the use. And in addiction, it stops being about how much you like or enjoy the substance and starts being about the ability of the cue to trigger the dopamine system and trigger intense wanting or desire. And that's what we were seeing more of here, that the cue really seemed to be more powerful than what was happening in consumption. There were limitations here to consider, so this was likely a conservative test. We didn't have a lot of individuals who met full-blown YFAS food addiction in this study. We're actually um, doing that right now, where we have individuals who meet full-blown YFAS criteria, weight-matched controls, and we're looking at reward-related processes in the scanner. We also are assuming some interpretation. These neural systems are involved in a lot of different mechanisms, and we think that it's tying on to wanting and liking, but we didn't have specific ratings of those constructs, and that's something we're doing now as well, to look at psychologically what is the experience like for the individual so we can link that to the biology. So one of the big changes in the field of addiction came out with the um, release of the DSM-5. And so the DSM-5 made some really big changes to the substance use section. We now no longer call um, addictive-like disorders um, substance use dependence. We, the name now is like addiction and other related disorders broadly. And that becomes in part because gambling has now been identified as an addictive disorder 
mechanism, an addictive disorder. Before it was kind of considered an impulse control disorder that people just kind of were impulsively gambling. And this was kind of saying, actually, when you look at the mechanisms in gambling, it really seems to parallel what we see with drugs of abuse. And this challenges our beliefs that you have to ingest a drug, that that drug is specifically changing the brain chemistry to have addiction. You can engage in behaviors that are powerful enough to also rewire the system in a way that's problematic. There was also the change of combining abuse and dependence. We used to kind of think that like alcohol abuse was this separate condition that was you know, not as problematic, and then substance dependence was this totally different condition. And the research just found that that wasn't the case, that it was a, kind of a gradient of severity with abuse kind of potentially being kind of lower on the spectrum, but not two different conditions, but a, a severity difference. So abuse and dependence were combined. So when you think about those diagnostic criteria I showed you at the beginning of the talk, there's been some additions. So it's that there are social and interpersonal problems related to use, major role obligations are given up, things like not being able to as effectively parent or be as effective in your job, and physically hazardous use. So this seems really clear with substances that have an addiction or a intoxication syndrome. If you think of alcohol, right, there are times where it's physically hazardous to drink a lot of alcohol and get behind a car or get behind um, machinery. With addictive substances like cigarettes that don't cause an intoxication syndrome, it's a little bit trickier to think about. Right? You can drive your car and smoke a cigarette. You can do many things because you're not fully intoxicated. So with cigarettes, it's been a little tricky. What they list in the DSM is it's smoking in bed, actually, because um, I, which was really surprising. It's actually, I guess, one of like the biggest causes of, of fires is actually people smoking in bed and then falling asleep. Um, so we, we also had to do a lot of thinking about how would this physically hazardous um, criteria apply to food, given that you're not intoxicated. And so we thought, uh, in talking with individuals who endorse and, and identify as a food addict, they would both say that food was so encapsulating in their mind. It was so much what they were thinking about all the time that they would be distracted. So driving their car, they would be not paying attention and thinking about their binge, or actually using um, driving and binge eating in the car because it was a place to be away from other individuals who wouldn't see them eat. Also, we thought about medical conditions like diabetes and individuals consuming really high doses of sugar in ways that would be physically hazardous. Um, one of the other additions was craving. As I mentioned, craving is this key, key construct in addiction. We see it, it's a really important in eating behavior, and it's now been included as a diagnostic criteria. And now there's a, a range. It's not just that you have a, an addiction or not, but you have a mild, moderate, or severe substance use disorder. So we then developed the Yale Food Addiction Scale 2.0, which then incorporates these changes into the assessment of food addiction. And what did we find? We found just like the original YFAS, the measure seems to be internally consistent. That means it hangs together, that these questions kind of all hang together. But more importantly, we saw evidence of validity. If individuals had higher YFAS 2.0 scores, they had more disinhibited eating, higher BMIs, higher obesity rates, more binge eating frequency. As Mark alluded to, we saw that it was associated with an eating disorder diagnosis. Individuals with food addiction were more prone to have binge eating disorder or bulimia nervosa, but about half of the individuals who met the food addiction diagnostic criteria didn't meet for another eating disorder. And I think clinically this is really important because you could imagine someone, again, coming into my clinic and I assess for anorexia and bulimia and binge eating disorder and I say, you don't have an eating disorder. The food addiction scale would say actually about 43% of those people do have clinically significant and impairing relationship with food that right now we're kind of missing in our diagnostic approaches. We found that the food addiction scale predicted BMI above and beyond binge eating frequency. And interestingly, with the YFAS 2.0 compared to the original YFAS, we did see a higher prevalence of food addiction. About 5.8% more people met the threshold. But even we were concerned about this. And generally, the field of addiction is concerned about overdiagnosis. We've gone from seven symptoms to 11 symptoms. We dropped the threshold from three to two. So overall, in addiction, we're capturing more people. But we found that the YFAS 2.0 performed better or the same as the original YFAS, suggesting that we weren't capturing people that weren't struggling. So more research is needed, but it's suggesting that the DSM-5 criteria appear to also map on to this consumption of eating behavior in a problematic way.
What's most exciting to me about um, what we're working on at the moment in my lab is I feel like we've worked so hard to say, can we identify people who appear to be showing what looks like an addictive-like phenotype in their eating behavior? But what is really missing in the whole field and where we're kind of moving and where the controversies are right now is what about the food? Addiction is the interaction between individuals' risk factors and the attributes of that addictive substance or behavior. And with food, we're only in humans starting to really disentangle and say what foods might have addictive properties and why. So Erica Schulte is one of my doctoral students, and this has really been a challenge that she has taken on here. And we were, again, using that parallel. What do we know makes a drug of abuse addictive? And we know it's a higher dose of an addictive agent and a rapid rate of absorption. So if you think of somebody you know, sipping a low alcohol beer to get their ethanol versus taking a shot, right? the shot is going to be more rapid and more problematic and be more affecting on the reward system than that lower alcohol beer, even if you eventually get to the same amount of ethanol in your system. So that rapid rate of absorption is really key. We find that when we think about these highly processed foods, these foods we've created in our food environment, we also think that they have this increasing dose of rewarding ingredients like sugar and fat. And some of them, especially when we think of things like sodas or sugar-sweetened cereals, they have this increased rate of absorption. If you think of glycemic load, you'll see where individuals will eat this food and they'll get this big blood sugar spike and then this crash, and actually an overcompensation a couple hours later with this kind of mild hypoglycemia that seems to be associated with intense cravings and activation of the reward system. So it can be very, very cyclical. So we were kind of thinking, I bet that glycemic load of a spike and a crash really maybe maps on to what we see with drugs of abuse. So Erica did this research. Actually, in California, it got picked up by the media a lot in the most horrible way. It was like one of those moments where I was like, oh my god, this is going like to end up in my eulogy of some sort. Where I was like, it was in LA, and the LA Times ran the story without talking to us, where they were like, Jesus, this addictive is crack. And oh, I, can't, I tell you, it like will not die. I just saw it came out again in the UK, and I was like, oh. And, and cheese actually wasn't that bad, to tell you the truth, in our study. So it was even more kind of shocking. Um, so you know, be, be careful for the media sometimes. And so what we did in this study is we ask people, you know, the behavioral indicators of addiction, never saying addiction in there, and then we looked at different foods, and we're like, what foods seem to be most tied in with these addictive-like markers in their eating behavior? So we either, in the first study, had them do this for forced choice. Is it more chocolate for you or more potato chips? And the second study, we did these continuous assessments, and that way we could do some more advanced modeling and say, here's the nutrient that seems to be associated with this higher addiction score, and here's the characteristics of a person that seems to be really sensitive to that specific nutrient. So in the first study, individuals filled out the YFAS. We didn't say any specific word. We left it neutral about what kind of foods. They had this set of 35 nutritionally diverse foods, some processed, some high in fat, some high in glycemic load, et cetera, et cetera. And so again, I don't think this will be shocking to anyone which foods ended up at the top of the list. You know, it's chocolate was number one, ice cream, french fries, pizza, cookies, chips, you know, et cetera. And if you think about this, when we go back to the beginning of this talk, and think about that fat-sugar combo, right, that like ne really is unique from an evolutionary perspective. Every single one of these foods that are high in refined carbohydrates and fat. If we go a step down, the number, the next quadrant of foods that people struggle with were the high carbohydrate foods that didn't have fat. Really, when it came to foods that had fat but not that many carbs, things like steak or bacon, people didn't really struggle with those in quite the same way, which for us kind of really made us think that like this carbs really seems to be potentially this key aspect here. Which foods did people not struggle with? Also not surprising. Although I like to point out like apples are pretty high sugar foods, right? But it's sugar that's given to you in a delivery system that's almost like a slow release opiate, Right, where we see that people aren't as addicted. And you don't get that big blood sugar spike in quite the same way. It's combined with water and fiber and citric acid that changes the way it's absorbed in your body. And you can't eat it nearly as rapidly as you can tossing back a handful of M&Ms. So that speed, that dose is really important. I like that beans is last. I, I, I assume there's an aversive property um, to like, you know, kind of really binging on beans. There may be some negatives. Uh, <laughs> so maybe that's an answer for treatment. <laughs>
Um, so when we looked at the individual characteristics, we found that the individuals in our sample who were the most food addicted, who did endorse the highest number of symptoms, the things that everybody said, those processed foods were a problem. But individuals with higher YFAS scores particularly react, were reactive to the processed foods. Importantly, the glycemic load seemed to be that blood sugar spike and crash. That, for the people with higher food addiction symptoms, that seemed to be what was really enticing for them. Fat didn't differ for people who had higher food addiction scores or not. So the higher fattier of the foods wasn't as enticing for them as that carbohydrate spike and crash. We've also been looking at some of how sugar and fat may differentially impact craving. And there's some suggestions that they maybe work through different neural pathways. Um, so Nicole Levine has done some work that sugar really seems to be related more to that intense withdrawal type syndrome. And really, um, Eric Stice's group has really done some work that sugar really seems to be more effective at activating the striatum, that kind of key addiction region. Whereas fat seems to be less associated with the withdrawal, but it really seems to be associated with weight gain and also with the somatosensory regions of the brain, that kind of mouthfeel, right? So we were looking at, are there differences for individuals who, are food, who endorse food addiction symptoms and how sugary cravings versus fattier cravings are related to different outcomes? And what we found is that this really intense carb sugar craving really seemed to be related more in individuals with addictive like eating to binge eating patterns. If you were a sugar craver, you were more prone to be showing this pattern of binge eating, that more what I think is the more addictive like phenotype. In contrast, if fat was kind of your more dominant craving perspective, that group, it wasn't about the binge eating, it was more about higher BMI. So this kind of maps some onto the neurobiology and animal work. I'd like to finish with, finish with two slides that kind of talk a little bit about why this might be a paradigm shift. And I think one of the concerns that we most had when we started doing this work is that obesity is one of the most stigmatized conditions out there in our society. And that's so concerning given the fact that it is now a minority of individuals who are normal weight. I think if we were doing this work and it was increasing people's feelings of stigma and their experience of stigma in our society, we would need to proceed very cautiously or not at all. And so this question was, will this understanding of addiction and addictive processes actually increase stigma? It's important to know because if we ask the lay public, 86% of individuals think certain foods, especially sugar, are addictive. Uh, you know, in the scientific world, I think especially being pre-tenure, I sometimes feel like, you know, I've got it, it's very controversial. Like I'm getting in debates all the time, and it's always me against someone who has like, you know, a lovely British accent who already sounds smarter than I am in like, you know, conferences. And, um, and so, it's super controversial in the scientific world, but from the lay public, I always get a like, duh, like why are you even doing this research? Like we've already answered this question. So the, the, you know, I was really relieved to see at work in 2014 that individuals who are exposed to a food addiction model saying that you know, there's something about these foods and the way that it impacts the brain and the reward system actually reduced people's stigma ratings of an individual with obesity relative to those who were given the kind of typical calories in, calories out explanation. So for me, that, that was a really key piece of whether we should keep doing this research. But I think it's really important to focus on the substance and not the role of the substance in this. You know, it's, it's so true that it's an interaction between an individual or a substance, but I think our narrative right now with obesity is it's all your fault. Right? You just don't have willpower, you're not trying hard enough, and that's something that in the history of addiction has been often the first step of how we explain an addiction. But as we start to understand how the substance or the industry creating and developing a substance are doing everything they can to really make a blissful, enticing substance that gets in there and really alters reward and motivation systems, it, it changes some of the narrative and how we think about addressing this. So I think we need to keep the focus not just on the individual and their risk factors, but also the contribution of the food itself. And we're hoping that you know, this perspective on the food and making, kind of thinking about its role, might also increase openness to policy implications. You know, we know in the field of addiction that a landmark moment was when we said you know, cigarettes weren't just habit forming, but they were addictive. Right, they were capable of getting in there and altering these systems. And that changed our kind of will and ability to make policy changes. So we've done some work here, and I, you know, I tried to avoid too many statistics, but I wanted to put this in here, where individuals, it's cross-sectional, but individuals who endorse, you know, I think, yes, these foods are addictive, 
right, they, that they're addictive, that they're problematic, that they were more, much more open to these food environmental focused policy initiatives, things like restricting marketing to teenagers, getting junk foods out of schools. And this was a very large effect size. And this is after controlling for things like political orientation, whether they were Republican or a Democrat, gender, BMI, race, their own YFAS scores. We controlled for everything in the kitchen sink. And that belief in food addiction still had this very large effect size. So the takeaway points, um, and I thank you so much for staying with me and, and listening to me here today, is that the Yale Food Addiction Scale is a measure out there that is valid and a reliable way to assess addictive like eating. It's not the answer. It's not the, okay, we got the scale, we're done, food addiction exists, case closed. It is a tool that is scientifically valid to help us further test whether these mechanisms are actually contributing to eating behavior. I would really like to leave that all foods are not created equally in their ability to engage our reward systems, to engage our motivation systems, especially when we think of our children, and their ability to drive forward this compulsive overeating that's particularly prone to relapse, where you can stop for a little while, but drug addiction, we see relapses occur for years and years and years, and that it's this kind of chronically, that, these, that they're powerful, that the foods are not all created equal and that we're really hoping that this may be a paradigm shift. We're hoping that some of the narratives about obesity and overeating and some of the blame-based narratives, maybe that this challenges this, and it opens different intervention efforts, and it opens different policy initiatives that will hopefully help us have a healthier society in the future. So I want to thank um, my lab, the Food Addiction Science and Treatment Lab at the University of Michigan. I, I um, talked about Erica Schulte and Michelle Joyner, my graduate students' work. The Red Center for Food Policy and Obesity has been essential uh, to my initial training, um, and IDDK for funding my research, and a University of Michigan fMRI pilot grant. And here's my lab, um, which is a, uh, I, I was trained in a bar lab. Um, so we, you know, we, yeah, we have a bar lab because like the cues and the context are so key. If you give people alcohol in an office space, they're like, meh, right? But if you give it to them in a bar, that's when you see the effects. So in food, I wanted to do the parallel and we kind of built a faux fast food restaurant. I won't say which one it's modeled off of because I don't want to get sued. But, um, you know, one of those. And it's also nice because my undergraduate research assistants have a backup career. They now know how to make, you know, milkshakes and fridges and all that. So I want to thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. take questions. I think the one thing I learned was that if there's any way we can create a therapeutic that um, adds beanness to um, the mixture of carbs and sugar, maybe some kind of after effect that people might not enjoy so much, we might be able to reduce their life. The ant abuse of the food world, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you've done any research with the bypass scores and like the histories of other addictions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's an excellent question. So the YFAS score, um, the YFAS with other uh, family history of addiction. You know, I, we haven't looked at that yet, which is kind of shocking to me now that I'm saying it out loud. Uh, we've used a lot of, unfortunately, having to use the thing I criticize of obesity as a proxy um, in these big nationally epidemiological studies. And what we've seen, um, going back to Mark's, you know, kind of preeminent work is that for individual who has a family history of addiction but who is normal weight, they are much more likely to be drinking alcohol than somebody's family history negative for alcoholism. In contrast, when those individuals become overweight, obese, and severely obese, not only does the effect of alcohol, like the drinking behavior goes down overall, but the effect of family history disappears. And there's some evidence out there that a family history of addiction makes individuals more prone to um, obesity and, and sensitive to the effects of sugar. And so we think that there may be this effect that maybe there's kind of this dual pathway of risk with a family history of addiction that can either kind of make you more prone to obesity and obesogenic eating or drug addiction, but if you develop one, you're not as prone to develop the other because they're competing for that shared risk factor that seems to go awry. But that's an excellent question and something I will definitely make sure I need to include in my next YFAS studies, especially with kids. Yeah, hi, great talk. Thank um, you. Can you tell me if you've done any research or if there has been research mm -hmm. done on the interaction between the substance that yeah, you're yeah. describing and the packaging, marketing, the triggers that sort of surround the substance? Absolutely. So. Um, the question is kind of thinking about the role of the substance and then its kind of context, how it's maybe marketed or the way that it's put out, the packaged. Um, I haven't looked at packaging, but 
I didn't plant you. Um, our lab uh, <laughs> is doing, this is a pilot study, we now have an R01 to study this, is looking at food advertising. Kind of going to like my big message about cues. I mean, when we think about the cues in our environment, there's so many, but food marketing, especially to teenagers who we know are really vulnerable, they see 6,000 food commercials, almost all for junk in a given year. And um, I'm not going to worry about showing you the video, but what we've seen is that those teenagers that have the greatest response in the striatum to these food marketing commercials relative to others, that they're at the greatest risk for weight gain over time. And the thing that was really scary to me about this is they weren't aware of it. If you ask, so are you impacted by marketing? Wait, no, nobody thinks they're impacted by marketing. So they aren't kind of consciously aware of it. Um, I haven't done other sorts of like branding, but I wouldn't be surprised because we know a lot of what branding and kind of marketing does is it sets expectancies about what you should experience. And we see in the alcohol world that children, before they've ever had a drop of alcohol, especially those at greatest risk, have really strong expectancies about how great alcohol is because of the environment they've lived in, the marketing, the branding, it's cool, it makes you popular, et cetera, et cetera. And I would not be surprised at all if those similar contexts are happening with food and that are setting um, kids up to be more vulnerable and motivated to try them. Yeah, it'd be great to get the reference you know, as part of the email afterwards. Uh, for the food marketing study? Oh, my pleasure. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to include that. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, when you were doing the key response and, mm -hmm. the, um, and the consumption of yeah. MRI testing, yeah. uh, did you also look at maybe a little bit later once after consuming the milkshake and afterwards? It yeah, the, the, yeah, the. Mm -hmm if there's also a response there. Yeah, so I have not looked at that, but Dana Small is doing some really beautiful work at Yale, trying to uncouple kind of what is the, this is to me one of the big questions, I talked about this with Ashley Mason for a long time yesterday, is like, when is the effect happening? Is it, my instinct is that the main effect is when it's in your mouth, actually. I think you get a secondary potential burst of reward-based functioning based on kind of the post-ingestive effects. Um, Dana's been showing that like sweetness kind of has that similar mechanism, but sweetness without calories is not as effective, and but calories without sweetness is almost not effective. So calories plus sweetness, the, the, when you get this one-two punch, um, we haven't been able to disentangle that. David Ludwig has done some really interesting work showing about that, like, that dip that you get about four hours later if you've had a lot of carbs and you get this blood sugar dip. Individual same calorie content, but one food's really high glycemic load, the other's not. Four hours later, the reward system of the brain, the striatum, is much more reactive to food cues and the high glycemic load food than the other, suggesting that kind of the post-ingestive effects can then set you up to want more food and be more motivated and more cue reactive, even though you've had the same amount of calories, which challenges the calories in, calories out kind of narrative that we've heard so much. But I think that's the next frontier, disentangling mouthfeel, post-ingestive effects, and kind of the, the metabolic aspects as well. And I bet we'll hear a lot about that later today as well. Yes. Um, what do you think uh, are the main implications of this uh, mm -hmm. research? Because yeah. um, you made the point that food is different than alcohol yeah. or tobacco. You can't just policy it away mm -hmm. because it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and food trigger foods, let's call them, are kind of ubiquitous mm -hmm. wherever you go. So, uh, you know, how do you... Um, how does public health and how does yeah. like practitioners kind of take this and, and do something useful with it? Absolutely. So um, the question is this, you know, so what, right? Like it's really hard. Like our food environment is so in our face all the time. It's not like with alcohol, that's why I always say is like, alcohol you can decide not to go in the bar. Like if I go to a 9 a.m. meeting, the chance that I'm gonna show up and there's gonna be a potentially addictive food there when I'm tired and I haven't had my caffeine yet is really high. No one's bringing in like little mini liquor bottles, although meetings might be more effective that way. Um, and so you're not in, as, as struggling with that nearly as much. So I think that there's a couple ways to think about that. I, being Kelly Brownell's grad student, think that environmental policy is key. And when I think about tobacco, I, it gives me hope. Um, Mark Potenza is a researcher that Mark Gold referenced, has this beautiful box in his office at Yale, which was the Yale Cigarette Delivery Service. And cigarettes were so ubiquitous that in the med school, you'd be hanging out and in your lecture, and then the Yale Cigarette Delivery Service would come around and they'd sell you your, your cigarettes as you talked about lung cancer, and that was just normative, right? With food, I think we're in a similar way. And, and, and there's some benefit, I think, that we do all have to eat. And one of the things we're seeing is that the foods that people find very addictive and enticing relative to those that they don't, the liking ratings aren't actually wildly different. 
people like, I love strawberries. I like salmon. I like, you know, these foods. I don't you have that same pull or intensity to binge eat on it. So it's not like, okay, you go from alcohol to water, um, but there is a potential shift that we can think about of finding foods that people do find hedonically reinforcing, but that they don't struggle with and making those a key component to their diet. I think making sure people are eating regularly, hunger, which I didn't talk about here, really seems to prime the dopamine system. If people are going fasting all the time you know, to, to really try and control, they may be setting themselves up to fail. But I think on a public health perspective, what we've seen with alcohol is we've focused on the person, we have much better treatments, but the effects of alcohol on public health and the public health consequences has stayed flat. Cigarettes where we've changed the environment through things like taxing, marketing restrictions, you know, policy initiatives have really been what has led to the, one of the biggest public health victories in, in the last few lifetimes. So I think that the more we do this work, there has to be kind of a political drive to have an environment that aids people and embeds them to be healthy rather than something they're constantly have to struggle against. We need the treatments to help people get there, but it's, I, I think that the money's gonna be in the environmental changes and we've seen that with every addiction. I'll take the last question. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, sort of a, a basic one, I guess, maybe from your standpoint, but um, we know that socioeconomic factors and um, neighborhood-related factors and other social determinants of one's station in life have a role to play with respect to their likelihood of being obese. Absolutely. But I wonder whether you've looked at that as a predictor a priori of anything else of what someone's YFAS a predilection is going to look like. Yeah, I think that's a, a great, great question. And you know, we, we haven't looked at that on kind of a, a variance of socioeconomic status. Um, Julie Lumang and Allison Miller's group did some really interesting work doing qualitative work with women who were from a lower socioeconomic status about perceptions of food addiction as the real thing. And they're like, yes, absolutely. That, yeah. Um, you mentioned about children yeah. and the primacy of exposure yeah. versus like when they're first exposed to alcohol. Absolutely. So have you um, tried to integrate whether a given YFAS score mm -hmm. that might predict a, yeah. a choice in a buffet type situation yeah. um, is affected by how early in life that person may have first been exposed to yeah. that particular food that they say that they um, you know, prefer. Yeah, so we're actually, I'm on a grant right now, um, again, Julie Looming and Allison Miller um, at, that I work with a lot at University of Michigan, where we've actually been able to recruit mothers when they're pregnant, and we're doing really intense reward-related phenotyping. I'm doing like sugar administration a little, little bit and doing face coating. I should have brought that video. I have a beautiful video of it. Um, is that... Um, we're getting mom's YFAS scores. We're getting really intensive dietary nutrition intake. When are they first exposed to certain foods? What types of foods? And we're gonna be able to follow these children, hopefully NIH funding willing, over the course of their development. And so we'll be able to say, we have really densely phenotyped these children. And I think what we're gonna see is that using kind of a behavioral proxy, I think, for YFAS risk that may show up later on, is that these babies that are exposed to more kind of sugar sweetened things earlier in their diet, I think we have two doses of sugar that they're exposed to, a 24 and a 50%, and we're repeatedly seeing how they respond to that hedonically over the first year. I bet the babies that get the most exposure are gonna stop being sensitive to the lower solution of sugar, and they're only gonna to respond to the higher dose, a, a tolerance effect. And that these are gonna be kids that when you give them the peach puree or the apple puree or whatever, it's not gonna do it for them. And that they're gonna be kids who are more motivated, maybe tantruming for um, sweets and foods like that. So that really prospective work I think is key because the retrospective report is so prone to error. Fabulous, well, please join me in um, thanking you.